It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. A beautiful day for a neighbor. Oh, it's the wrong show. Uh, good evening and welcome to the passage. Um, Robbie, you want to, you don't you turn that down. Just, I think it's because I'm standing in front of him. Maybe. Okay, that better? All right, so welcome to the passage. And uh, if, if you were with us last week, um, or viewing online, you know that I stated we're going to kind of change the the format of what we're doing, and and so, um, but but I couldn't get completely away from the fill in the blanks. There, there's something about that I, I just really like for people, and I know I know not everybody does it, not everybody you know takes a study guide, but um, but I, I think there's I think there's an important aspect when when you write something down. I mean, even if it's just one word in a sentence, I think it helps you connect a little bit better. And then for the folks online, uh, Denna Ellis was, was uh, kind enough to come in a little early today and, and uh, put slides up for the folks at home, uh, and we're going to try to do that um, throughout. As we, as we get ready, I want to go to God in prayer, but I want to mention a couple of prayer requests. Um, one is for Tim Nardoni. Uh, you may, you may know Todd Nardoni and, um, doggone it, what's the other Nardoni? Jeff. Jeff Nardoni. Um, Jeff Nardoni uh, helps lead worship over at Connection Church. And Todd uh, is a sound engineer, great sound engineer. Tim is their older brother. I believe he's around the age of 50, and he's over in Indianapolis. He suffered a stroke. And, uh, you, know, when I, it, you know, it's bad enough when it's someone who's, who's older, uh, but when, when someone younger, you know, is affected like that, it's just, it's just kind of a reminder of, of our own mortality, our own, how fragile life is. And, and then I want to mention, uh, you know, Dan Huffine. Um, Dan and I have kind of been partners in the gospel for years. We traveled together for years and years as two for one, and um, uh, last week, uh, Thursday actually, I got a phone call from him, and, and when I called him back, he, he was over at uh, Carl Hospital in Champaign, and, uh, and he has uh, been diagnosed with cancer, and uh, the issue is that the cancer is so advanced. Um, he has three spots on his brain, a uh, spot on his liver, you know, they biopsy his, his kidney. Um, his lymph nodes are affected. Um, he has a mass on one of his hips uh, that is wrapped around to uh, the sacrum, uh, and and the cancer is eaten through uh, one of his femurs. Um, and so it's really advanced. And uh, he's home now. Uh, they're preparing to go to cancer centers of America, and of course. You know, we trust in God. We uh, certainly trust Him to be the healer. But, um, you know, Ramona texted me, and he, she just said, pray for His peace. And, and I'll tell you something about Dan. Um, he is at peace. He is at peace. Um, he texted me the last couple of days. He said, my balling is out of control. <laughs> So he's been crying a lot, but but then he said some of it is tears of joy, um, and uh, and and a lot you know a lot of folks may not know the story. I'm not going to get into the story, but he and I had our issues for about six years. Well, actually, we had we had our issues for 20 years, but but we had serious issues for six years. And I'm going to tell you something. Part of the reason that he is at peace, and part of the reason that I am now at peace, is because of forgiveness. And because of uh, the forgiveness that Jesus can bring in relationships. And, uh, and so anyway, if I sound a little emotional about it, it's just because he's my friend and he's my brother. And, uh, and I love him. And so I'm asking, you know, y'all to, to pray for him. And, uh, you know, just pray for him and Ramona. And, uh, their two girls. And uh, so... Uh, so with that, I mean, I don't want to be the only one that brings uh, prayer requests. If something's on your heart, um, let's let's hear it and 
We'll pray for those things too. Yes, sir. All right. With one arm. All right. He can't do it. You know, I told him one time, I told him, Steve, one time, he's got shoulder, right? And he finally got it replaced. Got, he's got a shoulder now. And I told him when they do this, they need to do what they used to do uh, years and years ago. And a lot of people don't know this, but to keep you from moving it and being immobile, they would sew your thumb to your stomach. And I told him, I told him that's exactly what the doctor needs to do with him. So he won't move it. So that's a, that's a praise. Anything else that we want to be praying for? You know, I'll mention this just briefly. I uh, had a meeting last week on Thursday with pastors from the area. It really went well. Um, uh, we were... We were candid and honest with each other, and, uh, and so uh, just continue to pray for it. I hope the group grows and, uh, and, and that we're willing to be, to be real with each other. Um, and and we, I think we finally, you know, these, this group realizes it starts with us, and, and I think I also told you guys then it's going to be you uh, that changes some things in our society when it has, has to do with race. So... Anyway, a praise for that as well. Scott Fulmer's doing, he's doing well. Uh, you know, he was here a few weeks ago, but I think it probably about wore him out. So, uh, I don't, were, were they here Sunday? Okay, because we were gone, but, uh, all right, anything else? All right, well, let's, let's pray. Our Father in God, we, uh, we come before you and uh, we lift these names to you, these individuals and situations. Uh, some of them as praises and the way that you worked. I, I want to mention Robbie. I forgot to mention Robbie. He heard he's back a couple of days ago, and uh, he's been struggling the last couple of days. And, and as someone who has uh, back pain, I, I uh, <laughs> understand where, he, where he's at. And so, Father, I just pray for him. I pray for, uh, you know, some healing and ease and and the pain that he's experienced. And I pray for Dan. Father, we pray for healing in that situation, but we also understand uh, that, that sometimes you heal in a different way. Um, but Father, we love him, and uh, may he know that we are here to support him. Um, I lift up Tim Nardoni. I don't know Tim, never met him, but I do know his brothers. I know they're good men, a uh, good family. And so, Father, I lift him up and the struggles that he has ahead of him as well. Um, Steve, absolutely a praise. Scott Fulmer, uh, a, a walking miracle, and I mean, I mean that. Uh, and uh, and and Father, for the situation uh, in our in our country, all of the strife, we pray a prayer of healing. We pray, Father, that as leaders of the church and as the church itself. That we understand we may have differences of opinion. I, th I, think, of, I think of the struggle right now even uh, within congregations of, of the people who, who fight over things like um, whether someone wears a mask or, or you know, whether someone... Um, you know, it's hard to be the church and, and not fellowship. Uh, it's hard to be the church and not you know, love on each other and... and and yet, you know, we, we try to uh, discourage that during this time. But, but Father, it's, it's tough. And some people, um, some people, you know, trust you to an extent that they, um, that, that, that they may not wear a mask or they may, um, they may give somebody a hug. And Father, as the church, may we be understanding. And, and on both sides, may we be understanding of those people who are a little fearful right now. Some of them have an absolute right to be. I think of Bonnie Gaston and the fact that you know she's had coronavirus and and it it was in it to a point where it almost took her life on, on two different occasions. And and so, Father, we we completely understand when someone who is susceptible um, is avoiding. Uh, you know, physical contact, avoiding visits and things like that. 
And, and so, Father, even, even COVID has caused strife in the church. And, and I'm just simply praying, may that go away. May we be a people who love each other. I, I think of the old restoration plea in essentials, unity, and opinion, liberty. We all have, have rights to certain opinions, but in all things, love. Um, love reigns supreme and it's the call as as christians and followers of jesus christ and so father may we love one another even if we disagree and i pray all this in jesus name amen all right we're in exodus chapter 19 and 20 and we're going to get through as much as this uh, we can as we can tonight like i said you'll notice that i still provided some blanks for y'all uh, in this I've titled this The Mountain of God and the Decalogue. And you'll, you know, the Decalogue, if that sounds uh, strange to you or if it's something you haven't heard before, we'll, we'll explain what that is as we go. I've noticed that I've, I've kind of broken it down in sections of Scripture. And I think that's what we're going to do from now on. And so I just want to begin reading in chapter 19, verses 1 through 8. It says, in the third month after the Israelites left Egypt, on the very day uh, they came to the desert of Sinai. So three months to the day they come to the desert of Sinai from leaving Egypt. After they set out from Rephidim, they entered the desert of Sinai, and Israel camped there in the desert in front of the mountain. Now that mountain is called the mountain of God. This is the mountain from where Moses received his call to go back to Egypt from the burning bush. This is the mountain where God spoke to him and said, take off your shoes because you're standing on holy ground. All right? And so they come to that place, and oftentimes the mountain is really not, um, you know, they never have identified which one is called Sinai. Um, there, there's several different, well, when I say that, they have identified what they call Sinai, but several different mountains Three, at least, uh, were believed to be the site, okay? And, it's, and, and Moses uh, calls it Mount Sinai. So verse 3 says, Then Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the house of Jacob and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. So Moses went back and summoned the elders of the people and set before them all the wor words the Lord had commanded him to speak. The people all responded together, we will do everything the Lord has said. So Moses brought their answer back to the Lord. All right, so we'll pause there. This passion, passage is often called the eagle's wings speech. Because in verse 4, God says, I brought you out on eagle's wings. Uh, when, you, when, you, when you think of eagle's wings, that, that statement, is there a passage of scripture that comes to mind? All right, Isaiah, what? <laughs> no. Chelsea, what'd you say? It's on my arm, right? Is that what you said? It is on my arm. Isaiah 40, 31. And on this side, I, I have, they will rise up on wings like eagles. And that's what Isaiah says, you know. He says, those that wait upon, they that wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not grow faint. They will rise up on wings like eagles. And, and that's a representation of God carrying us along, right? I mean, it, it's, it's, it, it, it's representative of him carrying us along. And, and so, um, you know, this first part of, it's often called the, the eagle's wing speech. And what God says to them is, you have witnessed what I have done. I mean, it, just going to throw this out here, and I know it's going to hit you know, it's going to hit you uh, kind of by surprise a little bit. 
But I'm going to ask you, you know, are there, are there times in your life when God carried you on eagle's wings? Aren't there times in your life when he's done that? When he's, when he's lifted you up in some way and he's carried you along. You know, uh, we, we had the opportunity today to, to, to help some of our folks out. Uh, and, and I was talking to Dorothy and Dorothy uh, said she's been there, right? I hope you don't mind me saying that, but she said she's been there. And you know what? We've been there. You know, when we were in, when we were in college, and I, I've shared this illustration before, but um, we got hit with a tax bill of $1,500. Now, when you're making at the time $15,000, $1,500 is a big chunk of change, you know? And uh, we didn't know where it was going to come from. And God stepped in, and within 15 minutes, uh, Don Green, vice president, he's past president, but vice president at that time. Don Green showed up in the place I work, key printing. Tom Segel, he called me into the office, and Don Green was there, and he said, hey, uh, I want you not to worry about that, because we've got a donor who has given money just for that kind of thing, when students hit a wall or, or something. And so this donor... Uh, by God's grace, God used him to carry us on wings like eagles. Now, I was kind of dense at that time. It took me a lot of years to realize that the donor was Don Green, you know. And even in the time that I tried to recognize that and thank him for that, he, he wouldn't let me know if it was him or not, but I knew, right? And so... Are there those times when you've been carried along? Absolutely. And, and, and what that does is it, we are witnesses then to what God is capable of doing, right? We are witnesses of what he's capable of doing. And, and then notice, notice, what's, uh, notice that obedience is required. That's what God asked for in verse 5. Because he says, if you will fully obey me, and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. If you will obey me. You know, it's always been about obedience. I mean, do you guys understand that? In the garden, it was a test of obedience. You can eat from any tree except that one. They, they have one rule to obey in the garden and they blew it. Right, and when I say they blew it, we could say we blew it because I don't care if it was Dan and Margaret there, or Miles and Jennifer there, or Kyle and Carol there, or whoever it is, we were going to do the same thing. I could have turned to my wife and said, "It's the woman that you gave me." <laughs> and with Jennifer, with Jennifer, somehow she's going to turn it back on on me. <laughs> so successfully, <laughs> I didn't instruct you well. Yeah. <laughs> And, and so it's always been about obedience. And, and, and in fact, it still is about obedience. We, we were at uh, Philadelphia Missionary Baptist Church. Courtney Watson preaches there. Uh, Courtney is an outstanding preacher. Um, and he preached on Romans 12, 1 and 2. And man, it hit me well because not long ago, remember, we were there. We were in the book of Romans. And we talked about how everything is from God and through God. And to God. And then we, and it goes into Romans chapter 12. I, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to submit yourselves as living sacrifices. And, and, and Courtney, he drove that home. He was saying, What God's saying there is, I want you to be all in. I want you to be all in. And he used the illustration, and I love this illustration because it's so good. He said, You know, there's a difference between what a chicken brings to a bacon and egg breakfast and what a pig brings to a bacon and egg breakfast. The chicken makes a contribution, but the pig makes a sacrifice. And he said, you got to be all in, you know. And, and what he said in the church today, and this is true, I don't care what congregation you're talking about, there are a lot of chickens who want to make contributions, but they're not willing to, to fully obey. 
And, and, hey, and let me say this. Obedience has always been what it's about, but our obedience is not what wins us to heaven. We are one to heaven by the blood of Christ. Okay, so make no mistake on that. We are one to heaven by the blood of Christ. But what God desires from us is that we are all in with him, that we are fully in relationship. So notice that obedience is required, verse 5. And then notice that the Israelites are called to be a priesthood in verse 6. And it's not just a priesthood, but he says a holy nation. And, um, and it's, the, it's that priesthood of all believers. They are all to be servants of God. In fact, over in 1 Peter 2, 5, and 9, you might, you might know that Peter says that same thing about the church. That you and I are called to be a royal priesthood and a holy nation. Now, this is a key thing, especially with what we're talking about in our society today. There are too many people who believe that the church... Um, belongs out there trying to change our society and our culture. And I, I, I want to tell you that the early church did indeed do that, but they did, it, they did it in one way. That was by winning people to Jesus Christ. It, it was by changing the culture one person at a time because they understood that they were separate from the culture. That they were a kingdom of heaven. That's what Jesus came. He said, I came, I'm coming to, to usher in the kingdom of heaven. And the church is that kingdom. I love listening to, to Dr. Tony Evans. If, if you never listen to him, you need to tune him in sometime. Uh, out of Dallas, Texas. Uh, he's a black preacher. Uh, he, he, he preaches to a mixed uh, culture of, of people. There's white people there. One of my favorite stories that he tells is he says, he says I, had a, I had a deacon who came to me one day. And he said, hey. Uh, Dr. Evans, he said, we're getting too many of those people here. And Tony said, what people? He goes, you know what I mean, uh, lighter colored people. And Tony said, well, maybe you ought to get busy evangelizing and win more black people. And the guy said, well, what I'm telling you is if this continues, um, we're leaving. And, Do and Dr. Evans said, brother, let me hold the door open for you. That's Tony Evans. And, and, and so t Tony Evans, now what was the point I was going to make originally uh, about him? Well, we were talking about, uh, oh, I do like listening to him. And I wish I could remember what I listened to. We're, we're called to the same role. I think that's where I was at with, with it. Would you be quiet? Women, women are to be silent in the assembly. <laughs> but, 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 but Tony Evans just, oh, he, he's always talking about the kingdom. The kingdom. And here's what I want to tell you. Crossroads Christian Church is a part of the kingdom. You know, Connection Church is a part of the kingdom. Second Church is part of the kingdom. And, and, and you know, whatever congregation that, you know, uh, you've worshipped, that's part of the kingdom. If, if we believe in the same Jesus, and, and the Jesus the Bible talks about, and, and what happens, what's happening right now, is there's so many people who are wanting to include um, the social justices as a part of what our task is. And that's not what we were told to do. We were told to win people to Jesus. Because we're a different kingdom. We are a holy nation. The church is a holy nation. And if, you, if we want to heal our society, the first thing we need to do is heal our church. Heal the church of Jesus Christ. And so it starts there, right? And so 1 Peter 2, 5, and 9, Peter says, don't you know that you are a royal priesthood? The priesthood of all believers. It's, it's not just the leader's responsibility. It starts with us. It flows down from us. But then it's our responsibility to be the kingdom to be that holy nation. And so we're, you know, we're called to that same role. God wants us to be set apart for that. We're going to get to that in a second. All right, so Moses shared all this with the people. He said, God's asking you to obey everything he tells you. And I want you to see their response. They, the people all responded together. We will do everything the Lord has said. 
It's, it's kind of laughable, you know. But, but it does remind me of, it reminds me of the current situation too. You know, I'm sorry, but the, you all, we, all, we all know people, and I, I'm not trying to put judgment on anybody, but we all know people who when they're here, oh, lift holy hands to the Lord. And they walk out the doors and they transform right back to who they are. And, and, and so I want you to know that uh, even here, there's, there were claims that were made that they did not keep. I mean, you catch that. It says all of them together said, we will do everything the Lord has said. I mean, you guys, do you guys remember, you remember when you were first saved and the changes that were being made? And, and I was just talking to Dolores Norman about this kind of thing. Had a long conversation. And, and Dolores, I don't think she'll mind me sharing this part of it. Part of what Dolores was talking about was since coming off the mission field, she feels, she feels useless. She feels almost lost you know and i get it I, i've shared i've shared with kyle and i don't remember who all this has been on mission trips when i've been there but you go on these mission trips and you get there and 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 there's this there's this feeling you have of you're there for a purpose you're there for a reason i remember one of our last mission trips uh kyle came to me and said hey I want to make sure that every morning we start with a devotion, that we don't just jump into the work of the day. And I'm going to tell you something, that's hard for him, and it's hard for Steve Nesbitt, and it's hard for several others. And it was hard to lasso them in, you know, some, some, but I'm just kidding. But, but I'm telling you, you, you understood your purpose. Man, I was getting up every morning, I was reading scripture, I was having time of prayer, and, and I was focused on what God wanted me to do that day, because I knew I knew what was going to happen on this mission trip is that occasionally we were going to run into somebody who God appointed for us to run into. And on the mission field, you feel it. Well, folks, we are missionaries here. And, and, and the problem is when we get back to the familiar and we get back to the comfortable, we settle into roles that we shouldn't settle into. We get comfortable. And so, you know, I'll admit to you, I mean, I still try to get up and get in here and do some personal study to, to start the day. But I'm going to tell you the truth, it doesn't always happen. It doesn't always happen because there's all these things that are pulling at us. There's these, there's these things we need to get done, right? And so Dolores and I were talking about that, and, 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 and so... It's hard to keep focus sometimes when you're at home, when you're here, you know. Um, and, and so, so Dolores went with a shopping Tuesday. She loved it. Um, she she came back and she had noticed the weeds and the the flower bed up front. You know, Shirley Hawkins was taking care of that. She had a stroke, and so she's not been able to do that. And so she noticed it. She said, "Is anybody?" Taking care of that, and we said, no, obviously not. Chelsea, Chelsea had been out there that morning and tried to pull some of those things out, but man, they were they were tough. And so Dolores, after we got back, she went out and worked there. Today, Dolores came up here and worked out there for six hours. So you need to check that flower bed out because she's done some some great work with it and stuff. And you know what? I went out to her and I said, man, you you you're gonna. I took her a bottle of water. I said. You've been out here for almost six hours. She goes, well, I'm almost done. But she goes, i got to tell you, I love this. And then she started preaching to me about how working in a garden is when you're closest to God. You know, and she's talking about all the different arrangements and flying. And, oh, and i got to tell you this, one of the flowers that she's planted all around it is one called Live Forever. I think that's right. Live forever. And, and, and when it blooms, it has these red blossoms on it, blood red blossoms. And, and so she said, 
So she's preaching to me. She's saying, so, so understand, we've got a flower bed out here that represents who we are. Because by the blood of Christ, we're going to live forever. And I'm like, man, you, you need to come preach here sometime. Not really. She, she would speak, uh, not preach. But anyway, um, you know, she, it's the idea of, of keeping a purpose. You know, being purposeful about your day. Um, listening to what God wants. Part of what Courtney preached about on Sunday was the fact that in obedience, we need to submit to whatever God has allowed into our lives. And sometimes that includes pain and suffering. Sometimes God brings that. Now, I don't mean He necessarily brings it, but He allows it into our lives. Are we willing to be all in even when it hurts and and so it, it comes down to being this this priesthood that we understand our role and our role is to tell people about jesus to look for those occasions when he brings someone into your life and to make sure that the claims we make we keep submission to god all right, so the next section, verses 10 through 15. Um, this, this section, it, it says, And the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. Have them wash their clothes and be ready by the third day, because on that day the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all people. Put limits for the people around the mountain and tell them, Be careful that you do not go up to the mountain or touch the foot of it. Whoever touches the mountain shall surely be put to death. He shall surely be stoned or shot with arrows. Not a hand is to be laid on him. Whether man or animal, he shall not be permitted to live. Only when the ram's horn sounds a long blast may they go up to the mountain. And so the, the, the thing is, if they go to the mountain and they touch it when God is there, they're going to die. And he says, they're to be stoned to death or they're to be shot with arrows. Because you're not to touch them. Because if you touch them, then, then you will die. Okay? And, and so, uh, strict limitation. When I'm on the mountain, they're not to touch it. All right? And, and so, only when the ram's horn sounds, may they go up to the mountain. After Moses had gone down the mountain to the people, he consecrated them, and they washed their clothes. Then he said to the people, prepare yourselves for the third day. Abstain from sexual relations. All right? And so, this is about consecration. Um, the people are called to consecrate themselves in verse 10. Now, consecrate, is, is, it's not a difficult word, but um, in, in our, I think in our culture, it may be a word that a lot of people don't completely understand. But to consecrate, this is an outward act symbolizing inward working of sanctification. Okay? Now, I threw out another word, sanctification. What it means is to set yourself apart. And in this case, they are setting themselves apart to meet a holy God or the holy God. Right? And so Moses said, you need to wash your clothes. You need to take a bath. You need to make sure you don't have sexual relations because that will stain you. Uh, that will make you unclean in this situation. So Moses says, he says... Uh, Clean yourself up because you're about to meet God, right? And, and so, I mean, do we understand consecrate sanctification? So a quick question with that. They are called to consecrate themselves, set themselves apart. They're preparing to meet a holy God. Can you think of any um, parallel for us? where we consecrate ourselves, where we sanctify ourselves. Can you think of a parallel? Hmm? Communion? Absolutely. Yeah, during communion, when you get a chance to think, when you think of uh, your week, or maybe you're thinking of the coming week and, and what you're going to need for that week. Can I tell you something? Um, Philadelphia uh, Missionary Baptist, 
they are a congregation that celebrates the Lord's Supper every quarter, every three months. And I don't think it was coincidental that we were there on the day that they celebrated communion. And I got to tell you, it was kind of cool to watch. Um, They had the communion table up front, and uh, the trays were underneath a white sheet. You ever heard that story? You know, the, the sheet originated back in the day when there wasn't any air conditioning. And so they would have the windows open. And with the windows open, flies came in. And they would, if, if the communion wasn't covered, they would land, you know, on the communion. And so that's why they put those sheets over it. But I got to tell you, in watching kind of the ceremony, uh, Courtney came down. He put on white gloves. And he removed the sheet. And then he lifted the trays and separated them. And he gave them to two deacons, I would guess, who had white gloves on as well. There's an example of that they're kind of sanctifying themselves. They're consecrating themselves even by putting the gloves on. And so the Lord's Supper is a great example of that, or at least what we should be doing. Any other examples you can think of? Baptism. Baptism. Now, in the Christian church, I mean, there is something spiritual mystical I don't mean magical I mean mystical Um, because God is a mystery but there's something spiritual and and mystical that happens you know I often tell people it doesn't make any difference if it's in this baptistry in a swimming pool in a bathtub I baptized Kyle's grandpa in in his bathtub and and that was entirely up to him I mean personally I didn't see that he needed it, but he thought he needed it, and so we did it in a bathtub. I don't care where it is. The river, a muddy, a muddy puddle somewhere that's deep enough to get you under. You know, and I tell people there's nothing magical about the water, but there's something mystical about the experience. But it's also an outward indication that inwardly things are changing. The old man is gone and the new man has come. Okay? So baptism is a great example of it. Um, I've got some, quest- or some questions for you for application that will drive that home a little bit deeper. You know, things that you may do as you prepare to, to meet with God. Um, and you may have some habits. You may not have them yet, but you may be challenged to, to add something uh, to that. And, and so they're called to consecrate themselves. And then... And then in Exodus 19, 16 through 25, and in 20, 18 through 21, and I do want to read these verses, or at least part of them. Uh, Verse 16, On the morning of the third day there was thunder and lightning with a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast. Everyone in the camp trembled. Then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke, Because the Lord descended on it in fire. The smoke billowed up from it like smoke from a furnace. The whole mountain trembled violently, and the loud or the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder. Then Moses spoke, and the voice of God answered. The Lord descended to the top of Mount Sinai and called Moses to the top of the mountain. So Moses went up, and the Lord said to him, Go down and warn the people so they do not force their way through to see the Lord, the Lord, and many of them perish. Even the priests who approach the Lord must consecrate themselves or the Lord will break out against them. All right, now sw- flip over to 20, verses 18 through 21. When the people saw the thunder and lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain and smoke, they trembled with fear. They stayed at a distance and said to Moses, Speak to us yourself and we will listen, but do not have God speak to us or we will die. Moses said to the people, don't be afraid. God has come to test you so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. The people remained at a distance while Moses approached the thick darkness where God was. All right, so this this is called a theophany, okay? Uh, The theophany, uh, and that's spelled T-H-E-O-P-H-A-N-Y. Is it on the screen? Okay, I didn't know if it was or not. There it is. Theophany. 
And, and what it means is, is the appearance of God. It's when God shows up. Uh, there's another really famous theophany in the Old Testament. When Abraham is approached by three men, two of them are angels and one of them is Jesus, the pre-incarnate Jesus. Uh, it's, he's called the angel, the angel of the Lord, the messenger of the Lord. When you see that phrase, it's talking about a theophany. It's where Jesus shows up, where God shows up. And, and so this is a theophany, right? And it's not that you, you know, you're not going <laughs> to... You're probably not going to go out here and say to your neighbor, I want to tell you about the theophanies in the, in the Old Testament. But, but it's important to note that God shows up. And, and the importance of that is that the people notice him. All right? They, they, the people tremble with fear. I mean, that's both in 16b of chapter 19 and in chapter 20, verse 18. The people tremble with fear. Can, can you imagine what that would have been like? I mean, I, I think, I think that I would have been in awe of the fact that God was with us by a, a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. But, but God shows up here and, and, and he shows up as himself. Thir Third Day had a song years ago called Our God is a Consuming Fire. And that's exactly what the description is here. He descends on the mountain like a fire and smoke and, and, and there's a trumpet call and a mountain is quaking, it's trembling. I, 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 don't, I, mean, I don't know what we do in that situation. I, I'm not trying to be funny about this, but it kind of reminds me of the cowardly lion when he faces the wizard of Oz. You remember that? And he begins to tremble so bad he turns around, he runs down the hallway, he jumps through the window. Right? And, the, and, and so notice it's kind of like that. The people tremble with fear. And we would be no different. We'd be no different if God was to show himself in this way. And then, and then in chapter 20, this is the cowardly lion part. The people asked Moses, do not have God speak to us. You speak to us and tell him what he says, but do not have him speak to us. And, and what this is, is a call for a mediator between the people and God. We'll talk about that in just a second. But do not have God speak to us. Exodus 20, verses 1 through 17. And, and honestly, we're, we're not going to go through every one of these. This is, this is called the Decalogue. Decalogue is a Greek word that means uh, ten words. And in the Hebrew text, there's a phrase that's used that also means ten words. Or it means all these words. And so the Decalogue, I mean to put it short, is... Later in Deuteronomy, the Decalogue is called the Ten Commandments. Okay? So the ten words. And, and I think they get it from the stone tablets because uh, I don't believe the, the, the whole... I mean, I think there were words that represented the phrases that we read in... You know, words in Hebrew that represented the phrases, sentences that we read in English. You know? You will have no other gods before me. I... I'm the only God. And, and so, anyway, it's the Decalogue. Later in Deuteronomy, they're called the Ten Commandments. And, and I, to, tonight, we may, come back, we may come back and have a part two of this next week with the rest of the commandments, okay? But tonight, I just want to focus on one of them. It's the fourth commandment, all right? And so, if you look down uh, at the fourth commandment in verse 8, it says, Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you, nor your son or daughter, nor your manservant or maidservant, nor your animals, nor the alien within your gates. My goodness, if we try to keep a Sabbath for co-pilot, our dog, we just have to put him in a cage because dog's full of energy. But it says your animals, 
nor the alien within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. And, and so the Sabbath, and, and, and it means to rest or, or to cease from work. Now, in your application questions, I have, some, I have some questions about that. You know, do you keep a Sabbath? You know, why should you keep a Sabbath? And so we're, we're, we're going to talk about that just a little bit. In fact, what, the reason I singled this out is because through the years, there's been this, I think there's been this misunderstanding that, that the church moved the Sabbath to the first day of the week. All right. I don't know if you all know it, but we treat Monday as the first day of the week, but Sunday is actually the first day of the week. And, and, and so the, the seventh day is Saturday, and that's the Sabbath. Okay? And so there's been all this confusion about, did the church move the Sabbath to Sunday? No, we didn't. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read some scripture from you, even from the Old Testament, that shows you that this is all in God's design that as followers of Jesus Christ, that we worship on the first day of the week, okay? And um, that the Sabbath is, in, in fact, I'm kind of bold to say this, but because Jesus said this, that uh, the Sabbath was created for man, not man for the Sabbath, all right? And his, his purpose in saying that was, look, it's for our benefit. It's, it's a time when we rest. I remember when I worked at World Color Press, um, every 14th day I could claim um, the Sabbath. I could claim a day of rest. I, I often didn't. I mean, I've worked, I worked a lot of days in a row. But there were times that I claimed it because I needed some rest. And, and so understand that. I mean, I, I, don't think God is, I don't think God is militant in his statement. Okay, so I don't want to make it that. The point is, do we exercise a Sabbath? And could it be that we use the Lord's Day for our rest? Absolutely. Absolutely. But let me read, let me read some scripture for you. Um, first of all, from Leviticus chapter 23. Leviticus chapter 23, I'm going to read verse 15, maybe. From the day after the Sabbath, the day you brought the sheaf of the wave, of, of wave offering, count off seven full weeks, count off 50 days up to the day after the seventh Sabbath, and then present an offering of, of new grain to the Lord. This is often, that's the, the Feast of First Fruits, Okay. Now, I want to go back to verse 7 in chapter 23. On the first day, hold a sacred assembly and do no regular work. All right? And so even in Leviticus, it's being hinted at that the Sabbath, the seventh day of rest, and the first day of the week is a day that is to be consecrated for worship to the Lord, to bringing your offerings. Okay? Now, I want to turn over to 1 Corinthians Chapter 16, verse 2. On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with his income, saving it up so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. And, and the reason he says the first day of the week is because um, in the book of Acts, it was established that that's the day that the Christians gathered for their worship. First of all, it's the day that the empty tomb was found. Right? It was on the first day of the week. It was on a Sunday that the empty tomb was found. And I'll tell you something else. It was on the first day of the week, and it's connected to what I just read in Leviticus. Did you hear the 50 days? 50 days after the Passover. 50 days after the Feast of, of Weeks. Um, uh, I think it's the Feast of Weeks. No, it's the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Fifty days after the Feast of Unleavened Bread, it was called the Day of Pentecost. In the Old Testament, it's called the, uh, the Feast of First Fruits um, and, and other things in different places. All right? But 50 days after the Passover, 
um, they sell, the church began. It began on a Sunday when the Holy Spirit was poured out. And, and so one of the things I just want to do is straighten out that, that, that idea that the church somehow changed the Sabbath. I mean, the Sabbath is still Saturday. All right? Now, the point is, when we say Sabbath, meaning a day of rest, I mean, I'm convinced that it could be any time that you set aside to, to devote to God. And if it's Sunday, then it's Sunday. I mean, I remember watching A Little House on the Prairie. And, and uh, what was his name? What was Paul? What was Paul's name? Charles. Charles Engel, yeah. Charles... Um, Charles was sinning because he was plowing on a Sunday. I don't know if you saw that episode or not. He was so far behind. And his wife just came by. The priest, you know, preacher came by. You're working on Sunday. You're working on the Sabbath. And people have this idea. That's the Sabbath. No. Sabbath technically is, technically is still Saturday. But don't miss Jesus' principle. Jesus just says sometimes we need rest. And, and I know in, in a group like this, there are people who exercise that rest and there are people who don't. And, and, and the point is, is it helps us. It helps us to take that time, that time, and, and it's, it's to be devoted to the Lord. I mean, don't miss that. It's kind of reconnecting with Him, resting with Him. So anyway, I think I've driven it home enough. I think you get the point. But I got some questions in there to ask you about um, we apply this, all of this. All right, so, um, well, since we got a few minutes, let's go ahead and we'll talk a little bit more uh, about the importance of, of, of downtime and being with the Lord. Does anybody, I mean, anybody have like a testimony of, of how that, that benefits you? Um, if you? If you use it? I mean, anybody got a story or anything? If you don't, I'll just tell my own. I, and I know I shared this recently, but uh, Bishop Stephen from Nigeria, uh, important guy. You know, he was coming to our seminary and, and studying and you guys will remember this when I tell you. He, 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 couldn't, he couldn't warm up his water in the microwave, so he would come to our, our apartment and boil it on the stove. And uh, we were getting ready to go to Disney World. So we were packing stuff up. We were kind of busy. And, and Bishop Stevens says, You Americans work so hard at your relaxation. And isn't that true? We, we make it, we just make it hard. Uh, hard to relax. Yeah, and I'm not picking on anybody at all with this because um, I'll tell you, when Jennifer and I go on vacations, uh, we have a place in, in Arkansas, thanks to a couple in the church who blessed us with this timeshare. It's a beautiful place. Um, all sorts of things to do, but when we go there, <laughs> we go to Walmart. We go to Walmart, we get a few things we want to you know, eat and snack on, and then we go through the $5 movie thing, and we just pick a bunch of movies, and we go back and we sit and we watch the movies. We go down to the pool sometimes. Uh, I'll jump in the lake sometimes. Jennifer won't do that. But, I mean, that's the extent. There's, there's an ice cream place there, and there's a great Nazarene church there. And that's the extent of our vacations. Um, because honestly, um, I, I don't have a hard time relaxing. Um, and I will say the other thing that we do there uh, is we reconnect with God because we're away and it's quiet. And, 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 and yet, I mean, we've been on some vacations. Oh, well, we went to Disney World uh, a few years ago with the grandsons. And, uh, yeah, that wasn't a vacation. That was a workout. 
But, it, you know, it allowed me to bond with Daxon. I, I hadn't, because, you know, I, I got, you know, I, I'm a big guy. You know, say what you want. I need to lose weight, whatever, but knock yourself out. Um, but most of the rides, rides I can't fit on, especially at that time. I, I mean, I had big, big old shoulders and a barrel chest, and, and, uh, and so I remember when we went with Emily originally, I think it was Six Flags maybe, but I went to get on the Batman ride, and I sat down in that thing, and they got that harness that comes up here, you know, and it comes down, and this, these two people are pushing on this harness to get me in there, and they can't. And so finally he says, sir, you're just going to have to get off. And I think it embarrassed the daylights out of Emily. And so I just learned. I kind of looked at it and said, no, I don't think I can fit on that one. And so I, I would stay with Dax, and I'd let them go. And, and, and so, but, but it was a workout. I mean, from, from uh, I don't know what you call them, from park to park, you know, we went to work out. So, so we've been on some of those too. But, but the importance of reconnecting, of slowing down enough to listen. And that's what it's really about, to slow down enough to listen to God, you know? And, uh, you know, and, and so hopefully, I mean, you all have a time that you've set apart for that kind of thing. And again, it could be Sunday. I know a lot of people who do that. They go home Sunday, they connect with their family. Um, you know, they... They, they do things together, and, uh, and, and so uh, the, the Sabbath uh, is important. God wants us to be rested. And if you think about it, in our society, we rush from thing to thing to thing. Believe me, the last few weeks, every evening has been at the ballpark watching, and sometimes all of them are playing at the same time. And, of course, if you're not at present, when they're up to bat, then Granny and Pawpaw didn't make it to their game, you know, and so we're bouncing back and forth. We, we know, and God says we need time to slow down. Just need that time. And so uh, enjoy, your, uh, <laughs> enjoy your application questions. I hope they challenge you a little bit. And then I want to say to the folks who are watching from home before we close off, we are going to have these uh, application questions kind of, uh, we're going to have them online for the next few minutes so that you might be able to write some of them down, uh, those of you at home. And, uh, and, and so please, oh, <laughs> we're going to rush from something to something else. Um, oh, so... Uh, all right, so anyway, uh, we'll, we'll have those up at home. Take these home and, and kind of start this new process. We want, we want you to be able to take something away and, and apply it, you know. That's something I want to close with this because Courtney said that on Sunday. Um, it is not enough to know the book. It's not enough to know theology. You know, there's a lot of people who are pretty sharp in theology and they don't even believe in God. What counts is whether we apply it. And that's what he meant when he was saying, are you, are you going to be all in? You know, being a living sacrifice means that we take our lessons, we take our lessons and we apply them to our lives um, in a way that, uh, that allows God to shine. So, all right, let's pray, and then uh, we'll, we'll get out of here if you want to visit. We'll stick around and visit, uh, but let's bow. Father, we thank you so much uh, for tonight. And Father, you know, we, don't, we certainly don't take the Ten Commandments um, lightly, um, and, and I want to come back to those next week and talk about uh, some of them and, and uh, what they represent. And, and so, Father, now... Um, now I pray that you just dismiss us, um, you know, after the challenges that we've heard, after the examples that we heard. Father, may we be a people whenever, whenever we make a claim. Uh, may, may we be bold enough uh, 
bold enough to trust you because that's what obedience is about is trusting what you say it, 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 it it's like you know saying to a child that stove is hot and that child continues to want to touch it and, and we're just like that and so father may we uh take heed to your word and may we indeed apply it to to our own situations and lives and may we realize that we are indeed a royal priesthood holy nation that we are a part of the kingdom of heaven and you have a task for us all to carry out and so as we leave this place may we go not only with your peace and with your hope the father may we go with your power and your message we pray this in jesus name amen